Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the inaugural, the first, the official Mini Me Game of the Year Awards, where I, your host, Peter Mini Me, will finally expose how terrible my taste in video games actually is. 2022 was a cool year for video games, but here's a list of notable 2022 games I haven't played yet because I'm only human, which could mean down the track I'll retract everything said in this video when I do eventually play more 2022 games, invalidating this entire exercise. The first chunk of this video will be awards that mostly serve as excuses to talk about games that I kind of just want to talk about, and then I'll end the video with a countdown of my top 5 games of 2022. So there's timestamps, click around if you like, and without further ado, the game that ruined my life for about a month award goes to Marvel Snap because it ruined my life for about a month and it'll potentially ruin my life further. Uh, I was a Hearthstone fiend back in its early days and boiling that addictive Hearthstone magic down into matches that are about three minutes long is like crack. The reward systems in my brain just override any reasonable excuse to stop playing. Every Marvel Snap match has just a handful of key decisions to make, but those decisions feel important because games are so short and because there's a surprise amount of depth here. Decks are small, so I feel like I can build them on my own and get pretty far without having to resort to googling whatever the current meta is, which is a lot of fun, as is the whole location lane randomizer thing. Uh, what isn't fun is the monetization. Everything in this game is ridiculously expensive, but I haven't spent any money on it and I've had a good time for free, so you know. Can't complain too much. The game that ruined my life for about a week award goes to Vampire Survivors because it ruined my life for about a week. I understand Pokey's addiction now. The dinging noises and flashing lights made my brain activity spike. Seeing the big number go up and then a million Castlevania ripoff sprites appear on the screen at once and destroying them all so effortlessly made me feel all kinds of things. If you haven't played this one, it's a game where you simply walk around, pick up and upgrade weapons that automatically fire for you. It's so simple in concept, it shouldn't be good, it sort of pioneered this auto-shooter genre, whatever this genre is called, and the way it ramps up and introduces new systems and unlocks is incredibly satisfying and surprisingly inventive. Thankfully, I burnt out on it pretty quick, so it didn't ruin my life further. The game that I kept being asked my opinion on, so I finally bought it, Please Stop Asking Award, goes to Saints Row, which is funny because I haven't publicly talked about the Saints Row series much before, so I'm surprised that so many people have asked me about this, but I think it just is because it feels very mini-me core. This might come as a shock to some of you, but I have a certain penchant for trashy mid-2000s video games, and Saints Row 2022 is basically a modern one of those. And you know what? Surprise, surprise, I actually quite enjoyed Saints Row. By the time I got around to playing it, its reputation was absolutely ruined, and with my expectations being so low because of that, I'm a bit shocked by how much I actually kind of liked both the gameplay and the character here. Kill enemies to build an ability meter and repeatedly use this one ability to stuff a grenade down their pants and throw them into their teammates because it's the most fun ability. Fill another meter for brutal and corny finishes that bring back your health bar, and what results is a combat loop that's engaging on a very mindless level. The writing in this game seems to be the most divisive thing about it, and at times these characters do skirt the sort of hello there fellow kids Steve Buscemi line in a way that's cringeworthy, so I, I totally get it, but I liked that these characters spend most of their time just enjoying one another's company. They never threaten to evolve past being two-dimensional goofballs, and the game never really tries to be more than an absurd screwball game about hanging out and cracking bad jokes, and if you expect it to be anything more than that, then it's a failure, and as a reboot of a beloved franchise that often was something more than that, then it's understandable why this was a failure to so many. It's cliche, and it sacrifices a lot of the edge that Saints Row used to have, but if you're willing to meet Saints Row 2022 at its level, and you find some joy in its basic gameplay loop and some joy in games like The Godfather 2 on Xbox 360, then this is fun. It's just a silly violent game that treats itself as a silly violent game. Where the writing falters most, I think, and this probably has more to do with the game being clearly unfinished, is there's just a lot of plot lines that seem to go nowhere. You can can feel like the story is skipping forwards too quickly or missing a bunch of scenes because it probably is and and that sucks but still broadly usually Saints Row 2022 delivers on being a dumb laid-back hangout game 
It's got a million problems, it's very uneven, it's too short, the side content especially is quite dull, the combat shouldn't be as simple as it is, and the game never elevates itself in any magnificently exciting ways. I think if the game had another year in the oven, it could have been something truly cool, but as it stands, it's just good light entertainment, and I don't regret playing it at all, because sometimes you just want to dig into some excellent 6 out of 10 junk food. The game that didn't come out in 2022, but I played for the first time in 2022, and even though I made a video on it, I want an excuse to gush about it again now award, goes to Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex, because what an incredibly cool game this is. One of the coolest to ever do it. Uh, since I made my video early last year about it, my love for this game has only really grown. I've played it again on a CRT and just bathed in the visuals and, and the sound design. The vibes, man, the, the vibes here are off the charts. The loud, punchy gunshot noises, the acrobatics and melee animations, the gorgeous skyscrapers and moody drum and bassy soundtrack by the guy who did the Tekken and Ridge Racer soundtracks, it's all so good. And it's skyrocketed into one of my favorite PS2 games ever. Games I was disappointed by quickfire round. First up, Gran Turismo 7. I thought I'd love this game, and I had a fair bit of fun with it, but I put it down after about a month when I genuinely thought I'd still be playing it on and off to this day. The marketing presented GT7 as a return to the car collecting days of old, so I was keen to spend the first 10 hours upgrading a Honda Civic. But then the game started throwing cars at me, more than I ever needed. Then I realized every race was a rolling start for some reason, where you started at the back, so every race had the same pace of overtaking whoever is in front of you one by one. Then I realized you can't even sell cars. Once you get a car, it's yours to keep. Then I realized there's these ultra expensive, please spend real money on our currency limited cars that you can buy, which feels real skeevy. Then I realized the campaign structure was way more linear than I'd have liked, and at some point I just dropped off. Driving is still fantastic, the jazzy vibe here is still amazing, the driving challenges are a joy, there's lots of content, and I think I'll return to GT7 to play more of it sometime and see how it's evolved. There's still a lot to love here and a lot of attention to detail that you just can't really get anywhere else, but I can't confidently say that the single player structure in GT7 is as good as 20 year old Gran Turismo games, and the online definitely isn't as good as GT Sports Online was, so what I was hoping would be one of my favourite series return to form ended up being a disappointing regression. I've been itching for a good tennis game and Matchpoint Tennis Championship sucks. I was hoping to review this one, but once I played it, it just sort of sucked the life out of me. Its main problem is that shot making is just super easy. As long as you can make a certain shot, you can pretty much always make that shot to perfection. You can always do a perfect serve down the tee. You can always send your opponent off balance and as wide as possible with every single shot. Uh, I got to the number one rank in the single player in this game without upgrading any of my stats, and the only reason I did that was because I'm tennis obsessed and I wanted something to entertain my brain while I listened to podcasts. On the plus side, once I was done with this, I discovered a PS2 game called Everybody's Tennis, and it's fantastic. So thank you to Matchpoint for failing to satisfy my tennis itch to such an extreme that I desperately seeked out an old kids game. Need for Speed Unbound is a good game, but I'm a massive apologist for the previous game, Need for Speed Heat, and Unbound is worse than Heat. In Heat, every night felt like a dungeon run where you multiplied your heat meter by getting in cop chases. It was thrilling and it was rewarding, and that whole system has been removed, so the cop chases in Unbound serve as nothing more than annoyances. In Heat, the daytime was for legal racing and the nighttime for illegal racing, and they complemented each other with these really fantastic opposing reward systems. Like, you'd basically earn XP at night and cash during the day. In Unbound, day and night have been more or less consolidated into the same thing structurally. They, they sort of took out that beautiful dichotomy that Heat had and kept the day-night thing in the game, but you're basically just flicking a light switch and that's it. They also separated out the online and single-player modes 
experience, and where Heat's mix of the two felt like an alive world where you'd be joining randoms races and seeing cars fly past in their own races or cop chases, uh, Unbound's division of the two just doesn't land nearly as well. And this comes down to taste, but I also find the art style of Unbound works sometimes, but is mostly pretty weird. The dialogue is god awful and it feels like it never stops. Like. Saints Row 2022 really has nothing on this game, and just generally, Unbound doesn't bring the coolness or uniqueness or intensity that he did. And again, it's it's still a fun game, and I wish there were more games like this coming out, but where Heat was bold and experimental, Unbound feels too much like it's apologizing for Heat and holding back from doing anything interesting. Ghostwire Tokyo is a game I'll probably be repeatedly trying to get into for the rest of my life because it is the coolest sounding game on paper to me. I, I love what it tries to do with a real life location and blending Japanese mythology into everything, but playing it is shockingly clunky and the story is really awful at getting its hooks in. But again, I love what this is trying to do. I, I love that it's an original IP. I, I want to love it so bad. Just let me love you, Ghostwire Tokyo. Speaking of games that just don't feel right, Session came out this year after being in early access for ages. I also really want to love Session, and for brief flashes, I do. Perfecting your muscle memory to cleanly land a line can be super satisfying, and frontside flips feel better than any other game here, and when it all does click together, I, I think this is the closest simulation of real life skateboarding that I've ever seen, but the momentum physics here are so bizarre that it's off-putting, especially when skating on hills or on angles. Uh, it's all pretty buggy, the animations look cooked a lot of the time, and pushing around and, and just gaining speed doesn't feel natural. I want to support Session, and I realise they put this together on a smaller budget, but the game just doesn't feel finished, yet here we are with a 1.0 release. I think a sequel to this could be amazing. Before diving into the top five, some honourable mentions. Uh, I've already rambled about Marvel Snap and Vampire Survivors, so consider them honourable mentions. And also shout out to Oli Oli World for being another fun Oli Oli game. Just a challenging, fast, snappy, short mission skateboarding side-scrolling thing where it's simply fun to just land things. It's, it's kind of the opposite game to Session. This isn't at all a simulation of skateboarding, but it feels really, really natural to play. Stray is a fun little game. You're a cat who walks through a sci-fi city and it's super melancholy and low-key and moody without a lot of relief from those feelings. It's kind of a quirky cat simulator, but calling it a quirky cat simulator conjures up all these bouncy, bubbly feelings of lol cat videos XD and Stray absolutely isn't that. What Stray excels at is being a mood piece. Playing this on a big OLED TV is a delight worth seeing, and the way the game makes you feel minuscule in this enormous city as you tiptoe around the slums 20 centimeters from the ground while imposing skyscrapers tower above is quite evocative, and Stray revels in how cats move around, like making stupid jumps and landing on stupidly small platforms or climbing up to the weirdest places. It's refreshingly weird to noodle around in a game like a cat. Stray's gameplay challenges are a bit trite, and its overarching story doesn't really crescendo very well, but most of your time with it is spent absorbing its atmosphere and taking in cityscapes or super detailed interiors or back alleys and generally poking around being a cat, and it's a cool, memorable experience because of it. I just want to give a quick nod to both Elden Ring and Neon White for being fantastic games that I just didn't click with like other people did. I, I kind of played them and I thought, wow, these are incredibly well made, and then I didn't ever really feel like playing more of them, and, and that's okay. I, like, I fully expect myself to properly fall in love with Neon White, especially in the future, to such a level that I regret not putting it in my top five, but for now, I, I mostly just appreciate these two games from afar. Also, I want to shout out Wordle. Like, remember Wordle? Remember how big of a thing Wordle was? Number five on my top five list of games of the year of 2022 is Sonic Frontiers. Uh, last year I played a game called Tress Lunas. It was a bit of an abstract art game from 2002 by a famous musician named Mike Oldfield. It's a bit of a long story, go watch my video on it, but anyway, what you do in this game is sort of roam around on an island poking at things. You literally just go up to random stuff, poke at it, and it'll take you on some sort of journey. 
suddenly you're flying with a bunch of birds into a crater in the ocean and a giant baby appears and you follow a UFO into a volcano. For, for as goofy as this game is, I kind of got swept away by it. Which brings us to Sonic Frontiers, a game where you roam around an island poking at things to go on mini adventures. Dash into that jump pad and see what happens. Uh, rather than early 2000s 3D tech demo looking musical adventures, Frontiers sends you on these snappy, fast, frictive platforming puzzles through the sky, and the same feelings of excitement and discovery that I had poking at things in Tres Lunas I had here too, and I can't believe that the game Frontiers reminded me of most was the most obscure game that I think I've ever covered. These feelings of surprise and of discovery extended to the combat encounters, especially with the main bosses, which all went above and beyond in terms of spectacle. Uh, fighting as Supersonic against these Shadow of the Colossus size robots with cheesy post-hardcore music playing in the background and you're flying around in the sky is just pure corny bliss, even if on a mechanical level this is a whole bunch of absolute game design nonsense. That, that just doesn't matter to me while I'm smiling at how ridiculous it all is. And then on top of that, the cyberspace levels, while inconsistent in quality and apparently rip off a lot of old Sonic levels, were also a joy to simply discover and blast through to me. Uh, these feel like palette cleansers and pace breakers, and they draw upon all the linear level design of the last 20 years of Sonic games, for better or worse. Moving around this game is just pleasant. The vibe is low key, the music in the open world is reflective, the colors are mild, and you would think that this would work against a game for kids where you move this fast, but against all odds it just clicks together in a weird way. The movement is intense enough on its own, it, it doesn't need any more audio-visual stimuli, and there's something about being this agile in a game this somber that is strangely alluring. It's not redlining trying to impress you with as many sights and sounds as it can, so when it does ramp up and you battle a big stupid boss and the music kicks in, it feels special. There's also something to be said about how Sonic Frontiers opens. Uh, where other games, especially games targeted at kids, have these ultra hand-holdy openings that sort of take you through the controls one by one, uh, Frontiers just throws you in its world and tells you to figure it out, to, again, discover it for yourself. It's all about discovery, and it's refreshing. So while Sonic Frontiers is clearly a game with issues, I'm, I'm I'm sure those familiar with it have heard about all the issues, the, the pop-in, the jank, the third island that's frankly quite bad, the broken economy, the game being a bit longer than it needs to be, the production values holding it back. None of this really bothered me too much for a game that was otherwise so cathartic and so enjoyable to discover all the weird things it does for myself. Add a layer of extremely earnest and corny storytelling about the power of friendship and some chilled out fishing with Big the Cat, and Frontiers is a game that just puts a smile on my face. I think a sequel that builds upon what Sonic Frontiers does could be absolutely amazing, and I can't believe I'm excited about the future of Sonic games. What have I become? Number four on my list is Atari 50 The Anniversary Celebration. Uh, so I grew up well after Atari mattered in pop culture. I, I don't really have a history with them at all, uh, but growing up I was a massive dork who'd just consume Wikipedia articles and gaming magazines and gaming forums and online reviews and gaming history pieces, and I just generally tried to consume everything there is to know about video games. For, for as long as I can remember, I've treated video games with a certain reverence as these culturally important pieces of art and history. Atari 50 is a collection of over a hundred Atari games, which doesn't sound special at all, but this is so much more than that. Why Atari 50 is special is that it presents these games in a chronological timeline, where you can look at high-res scans of design documents and of arcade cabinet art and of arcade cabinets, and you can watch the developers passionately share stories of what it was like making these iconic games. They finally talk about all the drugs they were doing at Atari. Howard Scott Warshaw talks everything Yars Revenge. Everyone complains about what it was like after Ray Kassar took over. It's 
wonderful. It's like an addictive documentary where you can actually hop in and play the games that the talking heads are talking about. And it's not hard to be swept away by the passion radiating from these old dudes and radiating from this product as a whole. It's so above and beyond. The developers' digital eclipse even included unreleased games and reimagined a bunch of Atari classic games in a modern way and did a bunch of work with emulation to put this all together. So while Atari 50 didn't take me back to a 2600 playing childhood that I never had, it did take me back to all the giddy excitement that I had learning about all this stuff growing up. I'd love to see more interactive documentary style compilations like this because this feels like an important archival piece. It's set a new bar for these collection compilation games. If I had any complaints, I guess I just wish there was more video content in it. It, it sort of feels like they recorded a lot and held back from including most of it and condensing the last 20 years of Atari down into a single paragraph was a tad disappointing even if there really isn't much to say there. But otherwise, I got to the end of the timeline in Atari 50, wanting to try and program my own 2600 game. What I'm trying to say is Atari 50 turned me into a crazy person. Sifu is my number three pick, and Sifu is like playing a fantastic martial arts movie. As far as brawlers go, the way the combat feels in this game is second to none. Landing hits feels amazing, stringing combos feels amazing, finishes feel amazing, Amazing. The responsiveness of it all and the punchy sound design to match and the extremely fine-tuned, intelligent way they've built this system of combos, dodges and blocks is something that you just don't see executed this well very often. When you die in Sifu, your character ages. Your health gets lower, but your attacks get stronger. Ideally, you want to keep your age as low as possible throughout the game, which means retrying levels over and over to perfection. But if you let yourself age, you can move forward and finish the game as an elderly fighter. The game encourages, but doesn't force you, to perfect your fighting skills, and in retrying it over and over, you're almost emulating that training scene from every fighting movie. You're honing your skills because you'll want to become a martial arts master. Where this could be really repetitive, and I'm sure it is to a lot of people, to me it's incredibly satisfying, partly because the combat is just that good, partly because the upgrade trees are very satisfying too, but a lot of the reason Sifu works as well as it does is because the level design and the presentation is so effortlessly cool. The, the way the camera flows through levels and fights is so smooth and it really feels like every time you open a new door, you're treated to something striking. The way Sifu can make a hallway or an alleyway or a bathroom feel like a compelling space is really impressive, and the way levels ramp up into a final boss is so visceral, so heart pumping. It's, it's hard not to get swept away with Sifu's aesthetics and breakneck pace. There's a lot of truly beautiful moments to behold here that are executed seamlessly. With Sifu being such a difficult game, you have to be 100% invested during all the fights. The music's pumping, the levels become alive, every hit matters. By design, it can be incredibly frustrating, and I've bounced off similarly ultra-hard games before, but I couldn't take myself away from Sifu. When you've done your training and everything clicks together and you hit that flow state, you feel like Neo from The Matrix, just completely in the zone, beating down everyone in your way with ease, and it's, it's just beautiful. Number two is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, and there's a certain rush to just picking up a controller and playing COD to me. It, it just, it just feels good in your hands. The movement, the sprinting, the shooting, the grenade throwing, the aim assist, the sliding, the diving, they, they've had a very long time to perfect how COD feels, and here, COD feels better than ever, to the point where every other FPS game on console, barring older COD games, just doesn't even really touch it. I think that Call of Duty is one of the best video games released every year, and I know that's sort of a slightly controversial thing to say among us wine-swirling video game enjoyers, but the franchise has been ridiculously consistent. You look at Battlefield and Halo and Medal of Honor and what those franchises have been through and where they're at now, and what COD has pulled off in comparison is truly remarkable. 
And for this COD, they went all guns blazing, no pun intended. It's filled with content, the single player is like an incredible tech demo, the regular online modes are brilliant as usual, the new war zone is rad, the ground war mode is a stupid fun throwback to Battlefield's conquest modes, the DMZ mode is honestly a bit boring to me, but I might get into it. There's so many other game modes that it just doesn't really matter. Uh, really, all I really play is Team Deathmatch over and over, and as far as that goes, it's, uh, it's better than it's ever been. I, I even like almost all of the maps. I even like that border crossing map and everyone hates that map and I hated that map at first. The way the progression works has me trying out weapons and loadouts that I usually never do and I'm loving doing that and the slower pace compared to last year's Vanguard is welcomed by my old man reaction times and what I really love about COD is how well it works as a social tool. I, I keep in touch with my interstate brother through Call of Duty, I keep in touch with one of my friend groups through Call of Duty, I've reconnected with a couple of high school friends that I haven't spoken to since high school through this Call of Duty game, and we played the original Modern Warfare 2 together back in the day. It it's kind of amazing. I'm comfortable calling this the best Call of Duty game ever made. It's, it's just so fine-tuned and filled with fun stuff to do. That's not to say it's flawless though, it, it's, it's, it's still COD. There's all the monetization stuff and the stupid spawns and the bad maps and of course Activision Blizzard is a super shady awful company where it feels bad that I'm supporting and praising their game and for some reason I want to join the US military after playing this, I, I wonder why that is. But as it stands, Modern Warfare 2 is satisfying, it's addictive, it's fun, it's silly, it's impressive, it pushes the envelope and it's just an all around brilliant package. You know that amazing feeling when you play a really good RPG or read a really good book that has really good world building and you sort of hit that point where you want to embrace the whole thing and just immerse yourself in it and you want to know everything there is about it and just let it absorb your life. If you like RPGs, you can feel like you're constantly trying to rediscover that feeling when you first got sucked into the world of Morrowind or of Fallout or of Final Fantasy XV. Maybe that was just me. Pentiments, which is my number one pick, got its hooks in me in the same way great fantasy RPGs have, but Pentiments isn't really an RPG and it's definitely not a fantasy game. It's set in a very grounded, very realistic, very well-written 1500s medieval town. So when I obsessed over learning all about its world, like I would for something like Lord of the Rings, I was actually obsessing over learning all about the real world. It was teaching me history in a way that was so addictive and so immersive and so much more approachable than history textbooks would. Like that one time I took an ancient history class in uni and the lecturer wrote the textbook himself so we had to know it inside out and yeah, that was not okay. I just called Pentiment approachable, and I fully acknowledge that this kind of isn't an approachable game at all from the outside. This is a low budget, 2D, slow paced, text heavy dialogue with no voice acting game that is very outside of current pop culture or current trends. It's intimidating. But the way it uses a murder mystery as a storytelling catalyst works so well to get its hooks in, and the characters are written in such a deeply realistic manner that you'll quickly learn to relate to and care about them and want to see their stories through. Despite the cartoony facade, Pentiment is a radiant and refreshingly grounded depiction of everyday medieval life, and in a medium overflowing with shootouts and sci-fi and fantasy, it's nice to play a game that feels so real. With how expertly it handles its themes, characters and storytelling, Pentiment is a real testament to how much good writing can elevate a game into something great. That's not to say the game isn't impressive outside of its writing. Uh, the attention to detail and craftsmanship with the dialogue fonts and the way the characters and backgrounds are drawn to look like medieval art and all the historical accuracy that you can tell is super well researched from the town festivals and rituals all the way down to the meals that the locals cook for you to eat. It's all so immersive and hard to fault. The music too is especially moving. Pentiment feels like a game that wanted to get made, you can feel the passion behind it, and as a big dummy that's usually drawn towards high production nonsense like Call of Duty and Saints Row and Dwayne The Rock Johnson's Spy Hunter Nowhere to Run, uh, Pentiment is my game of the year for 2022.